Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ernest Coe, and I have Steve Ritchie here with me, and we're both from the Proof Group. Uh, our topic today is an introduction to the uh, to net revenue management. Uh, we're going to cover sort of the basics of net, net net revenue management. Some of you may have heard of the phrase or the term, and for those of you who have not, no fear, because it's going to be a very gentle introduction to the concept. A quick thing about Proof, uh, we do software for schools, mostly independent schools. Our focus has been with uh, admissions offices, alumni management, uh, donor management, SIS, the whole gamut of it. So let's dive right in. Steve, you ready? Yep, we're here. Yep. <clears throat> so let's quickly get started by asking sort of the big question of the day. What is net revenue management? Well, we think of net revenue management as sort of a data-driven approach to uh, maximizing your tuition revenue. So the idea is that there must be a way, mathematically or statistically, to figure out how you get the most bang for your buck. And that's what we're talking about today. Another way of putting it is to think about how you maximize where you put your financial aid resources. So it's not just about where you set your price, but really how much you're giving away in financial aid and how you're giving away what you're giving away in financial aid. So again, net revenue management in our, in our thinking is really sort of a strategic application of your tuition discounting, aka financial aid, to really get a specific enrollment and in, in institutional goals. Um, and we really don't talk about net revenue management independent of what you're trying to achieve as a school. And this is a theme that we're going to come back to over and over again. Without getting uh, too far into it, let me quickly run over some definitions. And if I'm going too fast or go too slow, I'm going too slow. Please don't hesitate to let Steve know, and I'll moderate my pace here. Uh, tuition. Well, tuition is a fairly standard term. Uh, in terms of net revenue management, we think of tuition really as a sticker price for the attendance of the school, really what you put on a brochure, what you, pub what you make public to other people. It's not necessarily what people are paying. It's what you say uh, the cost of tuition is publicly. Okay. The price of that uh, tuition uh, is determined by a number of things, uh, mainly demand or market forces, um, whether or not your, your brand um, and the, comp com uh, the competitive field, the programs you're offering. Um, a lot of things go into the mix here, but the important thing to note here is <clears throat> price is not an independent thing. It's really bound up by a number of factors that come into play, and we have to be sensitive to those when we try to set our price. But price is critical to understanding how we want to begin sort of a net revenue management strategy. Because if we know price, if we know what people are willing to pay, then we can from there determine how we go about discounting uh, from that price. So in theory, if you, if you know what people are willing to pay, or at least what one person might be willing to pay, then you, in theory, you might be able to know where the publisher stick the price. Financial aid is the backside of that. Financial aid is basically a discounting tool. Uh, what financial aid is, in net revenue management terms, is the money you give to offset financial need for students, but also to in increase incentive for them to enroll. So it's a tool to get the right kids that you want and to maximize the amount of revenue you bring into the school. I want to talk more about how this works in a minute here. So again, some basic uh, definitions. The tuition discount term that you see flying around in net revenue management uh, speak is the sticker price minus, uh, minus your financial aid package. And if you look at the discount rate, that's simply the total aid that's been awarded divided by the gross tuition that gives you a discount rate. So again, just real quick, your discount, this is what you say your price is, what your tuition is, minus your aid, and that's your discount amount. And discount rate is just really all of that, all of that A divided by gross tuition. Okay. So what we're talking about here is really how we maximize, uh, how do we get the maximum amount of net revenue. Um, and the definition for that is really when you give exactly the right amount of aid to every single enrolling student. Now, this is sort of an important point because when we talk about this, the thing I want you to to think about in terms of how you operate financially at your school is whether or not you're giving, you believe you're giving exactly the right amount to the students that are coming in. Are you overpaying or are you underpaying? Do you know and how do you know that? 
That, in a nutshell, is what net revenue management is all about. Why do we care about this? Well, duh, I mean, in some ways it's fairly obvious. We want to make more money, but it's a little bit more than that. We need to qualify this and say that it's really about making as much money as possible given our enrollment goals and the institutional objectives. Right? It's not just plainly about getting as much revenue as possible. It's about lining our revenue goals with our, uh, with our institutional or academic or our marketing objectives. And B, it's really about not overpaying. So if you're giving $5,000 more to some family who would already be coming if, with a given aid, you've overpaid. And on the flip side, it's not underpaying. If there's a really desirable family, a student who wants to come, and you haven't given them the right amount of package, uh, you've missed the opportunity there. Okay. But the most important factor is to do it in a non-arbitrary fashion. So you can do this predictably over and over again. So that financial aid and financial aid awarding doesn't become you know, this sort of dark art, this black magic of the, the admissions world. Uh, it becomes more of a science and a predictable, predictable exercise. So I'm going to quickly show you some pretty pictures here to illustrate what discounting looks like. Right? Now again, um, buckle your seatbelts here because this is a really grossly oversimplified model. This is not meant to represent any real world or any real school, but, um, um, but do keep that in mind. Um, in my hypothetical school, uh, the research and data tells us that uh, I've got 50 students who will probably enroll if we set our tuition price at $40,000. But if I simply set that price at $20,000, guess what, I'll get 250 students, which happens to be my enrollment target. So the question I have today is, why don't we simply just set our price at $20,000? We'll fill all the seats that we have and make our target. Well, that seems nice. But let's take a look at why that's not a good idea. Well, at 50 kids, at $40,000, you can see my, my blue lines there. They, they, that number gets me a total revenue of $2 million, which is compared to what we would get at 250 students at $20,000, that gets us revenue total of $5 million. Now, the question is, can we do more than $5 million? Are we totally maximizing our revenue? Well, if we know that we can fill the school at $20,000, but 50 more students are willing to pay $40,000, we're leaving some money on the table. So again, this is hypothetical. This is totally exaggerated and conveniently very simplistic, but you get the basic idea. The question is, can we incrementally or along the curve between that blue and that red line, can we leverage our financial aid and maximize our revenue so that we're getting everything in between to a point where we're getting more money and as well as um, filling up our enrollment targets. If you look at my yellow box there, you'll see that I have about $2 million here in financial aid. That's also known as my discount amount. That $2 million is the potential of what I may, what's potentially available to me to leverage to, to maximize my revenue. Okay, and what is my net revenue possibility? It's actually $8 million. And we can go through the arithmetic of uh, getting that number, but basically it's the area under the, under the curve. Or rather, if, um, if you have 50 students who are willing, or if you have 250 students willing to pay full, full price to come to school, that's a $10 million revenue target, but we can't get that. Uh, but if we discount it along the way, the maximum amount of revenue we can get if we discount it properly, if every single dollar that we gave out was efficiently uh, done so and efficiently given out to the right kid the right amount, we have a chance of getting $8 million total, which is way more than the $5 million that we would get, we would get simply by setting a flat uh, $20,000 tuition rate. So that's the key here. So with optimal discounting and spending $2 million in eight, we get $8 million in net tuition revenue. So for some of you, this may not be news. Now, discounting is something that a lot of people do. You are giving financial aid. The real question is whether or not you know who you're discounting and how much and why. So if you could tailor your discount rate 
in such a way that it's targeted per student or per segment of students, you have much better control and you much have better, much uh, greater capability of maximizing every dollar along the way. Okay. Well, how do you do this? Well, this gets into some fairly complex territory, so we won't go very deep. I'll give you sort of the, the basic um, uh, contours of that. But in a nutshell, we do this by developing models, or statistical models to represent specific types of students. So it may be impractical to figure out uh, aid on the per student basis, but statistically we can develop models to qualify different groups of people, say your suburban day students or your athletes from uh, far away or your international students or your, um, your artists or your athletes. Whatever those segments are that, that match up or align up with the interests of your school or the enroll enrollment profile that you want, those can all be part of your enrollment strategy and your net revenue model. Uh, the key is it has to be about your school and more importantly it has to be about your school with some history. So if you want to get started with net, net revenue management, and this is what we tell uh, people we talk with, the key to all of this is good data and not simply good historical data from last year but good data from multiple years. Because without which, um, without that sort of data we can't do any projections, we can't project forward from what's been done in the past. Okay. And again, I want to emphasize a couple of things. You know, it's not about net revenue management. Net revenue management is not about just arbitrarily maximizing revenue. It's really about focusing financial aid so that you are achieving specific enrollment goals that are important to your institution. Um, but generally speaking, here are the couple, here are the, the, the strategies that people follow or that you ought to follow if you're applying net revenue management. If your school is already at capacity, what you want to do is focus on your discount rate and your student body makeup, right? Because you already have demand that you know you can fill your seat. So it's really about figuring out whether or not we can maximize our revenue uh, to get the student body that we want. But you, if you're under-enrolled, net revenue management can help you too because it's about figuring out how you maximize the revenue given your your uh, given the, and the, the, the enrollment strategy, the enrollment you know, targets that you need to set to fill your, to fill your school. But in all cases, what's really important is that um, it's not just about the new kids coming in. Net revenue management is also focused on retaining current students. So we're not really talking strictly about admitting new students here. Net revenue management is really an enrollment management concept. It has to apply to all four years or eight years or how many years that your school, uh, your, your kids come to school. Um, because every, every student that you lose along the way is somebody that you have to fill down the road. Okay. I want to give you a quick snapshot of um, how we measure or how we gauge where schools are in the process. Uh, we see a lot of schools and a lot of databases and frequently we have to make an assessment as to uh, where we need to begin to, to uh, to leverage our expertise. So this is a quick chart and you can sort of mentally gauge where you are. But typically we say that if you have nothing, no databases, no historical data, uh, we are at level zero and we've got to start there. Um, get a database, start getting historical data in. Um, but if you're already doing some of that um, and you don't have year-on-year uh, -year historical data, um, that's sort of level one. And you can move up along the chain. Most people are probably at two or three where you have some data. You're doing some analysis between the relationship uh, between enrollment and tuition revenue. And you're probably doing some longitudinal or aggregate, aggregate data um, um, reports. Uh, that's very good. But where it becomes really powerful if you start to do sort of analysis and segments of groups of students. Uh, you're profiling um, student prototypes essentially. When we, when we talk about net revenue management, we're looking at the five and six territory, which is really using statistical models to analyze our segments and to figure out the relationship between tuitions, uh, tuition rates, and to figure out discounting around them and to simulate how we can project what happens if we increase or decrease tuition or financial aid, financial aid for each, each of those segments so that we can tailor our uh, financial aid uh, strategy um, in a more surgical fashion. So to wrap this all up here, 
in the next few minutes. The reality is that most schools are doing some sort of financial aid discounting. Um, that's not news. But the reality is also that most schools are giving more aid than are probably necessary to some families. And worse, they're, giving, they're not giving enough to the kids that they really want. If you happen to be one of the few schools who can be completely need blind and meet all the need for all the students that you're admitting, then you can conveniently ignore this. But if you're in the territory or in the camp uh, that most schools are in, which is um, you have to leverage the financial aid carefully, uh, we really think that net revenue management is exactly the way to go. But to get started, we recommend a few things. Um, you don't have to get into statistics immediately, but what you do need to do is to start to think about tracking year-on-year -year data. And this is really critical, that this is not just generic demographic data, this is about tracking inquiries or demographic um, data points or family profile points uh, in your system that is specific to your school. Um, you really want to think about things that differentiate you in the market. So we really believe that your database has to model the sort of students that you want to attract uh, in your market. All right, so make sure you're tracking data, not just generic data because that's nice, but track data that you think that has relevance to the kind of students that you want to bring into school. And part B of this is to start thinking about segments. What kinds of, what types of students are you attracting? Are these scholar artists, scholar athletes? Are these, are these um, uh, athletes who have you know, specific interests in different sports? Are these uh, specific kinds of science students, specific kinds of um, students with specific interests? I mean, these are all really good questions. And the more you're able to build segments and profiles of these students, the better you are in the future to begin to build uh, statistical models to, to represent them. Finally, it's really you know, all about the data, as we say. Uh, do not forget that in this process, ultimately, you want to track also your aid requests, how much you're giving, your yield, your attrition numbers. Uh, and you want to start to build your models with year-on-year -year data so that you're looking at both non-enrolled students and enrolled students. So this is the key point. Don't just track the data about people who have come to school, who have accepted your, accept, your, your, accept, your acceptance letters, letters and have enrolled in school. We want to know information about people who have decided not to attend. That's really key. Okay? So with that, let me quickly just um, wrap this up and say you can read more about this. Um, there's some resources on, on the internet uh, that are very useful. Um, I'm going to leave this slide, I think, um, available to you, but you can check out the resources page and look at some of the, uh, the people that are doing this today that you might find to be extremely useful here. Um, here's our contact information. If you have any questions, you're welcome to ask me or Steve. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Steve. Great, thanks. Um, so I did not see any uh, questions come through. Uh, I don't know whether that's because there are none, uh, but if, if indeed that's the case, um, I just want to, uh, to go back here and point out that uh, a, a lot of what Ernest is talking about in terms of, of uh, your, your revenue goals and, and your enrollment goals comes down to building the kind of school that you want to build. Uh, and so as we talk about uh, leveraging your financial aid, um, it's, it's in part a way to, to make sure that you are meeting the needs that people, uh, that people are expressing. Uh, but it's also in part to perhaps uh, figure out with a specific group, uh, if I gave an extra $500, could I keep that science student from going to the school down the street, for example. Um, would an extra, an extra amount in this grant uh, bring that, that athlete or bring that musician uh, into my school? And over time, you develop enough data that you can start to see your own trends. And, and net tuition revenue is really about, uh, about looking at those trends uh, and, and seeing the patterns that develop over time so that you can develop those 
those student models, you have those prototypes, um, and you can start to play around with, well, what happens if, if I apply a little bit more tuition aid to this segment? Uh, what does that do to my, to my tuition numbers? Or if I change that over to another segment, um, do, I, do I start to see my classes balance out better? Do I start to see my revenue numbers balance out better? Um, this can be a very arbitrary thing if you aren't going uh, with some sort of a guideline, some sort of a statistical guideline, and, and sort of the, the art of net revenue management, uh, which really does get very complicated and, and really isn't, um, isn't easy, uh, is to figure out uh, what are those optimal models uh, so that you can set your revenue, set your, your financial aid, set your goals uh, in a way that is sustainable, that is predictable, uh, that can, can give you the most benefit over time. Steve and uh, Ernest, this is Karen uh, typing in. I don't know if you're seeing the questions that are appearing now, but um, if not, I, I would like to read them to you so we can get them. Yeah, I'm, I'm not actually seeing any, so that's Okay, that's great. great. Um, John Aim is actually um, asking if we could, if they could see the resources page again. So Ernest, if you could put that resources page um, of the presentation up again for everyone to see, that would be awesome. Um, the first question is from Roberta Osorio. She's asking, how many years of data is optimal and what type of trends are you looking for? Probably at least four. Um, and trends-wise, I mean, I, I would say focus less on, on trends and, and focus more on key data points, key performance indicators. Uh, typically, you know, I mean, you have your basic ones. I mean, the, you know, geography, you know, things like uh, interests, uh, number of inquiries. I mean, those things are really important. Um, but more specific ones about your institution, you know, different types of interests, whether they're interested in specific programs or not, uh, interest in specific offerings at a school, uh, different types of students, whether they're self-identified as artists or athletes. I mean, again, it all depends, but those are the kinds of things that are, that are uh, depending on the kind of school you are, what kind of, what kind of enrollment strategy that, you know, you're applying, uh, those may be examples of, uh, of important data points. And I, I, would add, I would add to that that the other kinds of data points that you want to start to, to keep an eye on uh, would be in the, the, the attrition rates. Um, who's leaving? Why are they leaving? Um, you know, are you, seeing, are you seeing specific points along, along your, if you're a K-12 school, are you seeing those specific drop-off points where, where folks are, are heading to other, to other schools? And, right. and why are those happening? Um, so that you can, start to, you can start to investigate, you know, how... Uh, to how your your uh, financial aid perhaps can can be informed there, or how your program in general, uh, your your overall admissions and, and enrollment program, uh, can be informed by by those kinds of data. The other thing to add is competitive um, schools. So if you know that kids are going elsewhere, and they've told you that you know they're declining an offer and going to a different school. That's really important. The key is don't just track the positive outcomes, track the negative outcomes too. So if you accepted somebody and they didn't come, uh, it's important to know that they didn't, A and B, Y, and, and see how much aid you were offering or not offering. Okay, good point. Um, Rick Fields is asking, what if you are below capacity but already have 50 to 60% of your student body on financial aid with average discount already at nearly 40% off? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. That's an interesting question. But I think net revenue management is also really important there because you want to maximize every dollar that you're discounting at that point. So, you know, if you have a 40% discount rate or higher, uh, chances are that's not very effectively, not efficiently used. Uh, even for schools that are under-enrolled, there's, you know, you may not have a lot of room to adjust your, your to move your sticker price around. Um, but you can still set targets you know, for the kinds of students you, you, you may want to get so that your overall student body still lands where you think you want it to be, but you know, maybe you're more aggressive in one area and less aggressive in some. Um, the important point is that you know, for under-enrolled schools, you know, it, it may be even more important to, to think about net revenue management because uh, you're probably leaving, you're probably overpaying um, because the discount rate is so high. 
uh, until you know who you're paying, what you're paying, you know, and, and have a way of seeing that um, in, in a historical way, it, it's very difficult to know where to, to make the, the, the changes. Okay, um, Allison Kimberly is asking about um, undocumented aid, i.e. aid awarded arbitrarily and not based on the PFS, just to get the kid. Uh, that practices surrounding that situation? Steve, do you want to take that or do you want me to handle that? Um, I, I'll, I'll start. Uh, sure. I, I think that that's, that speaks a little bit to, to the strategy that you're, that you're trying to employ with your with your use of aid. Um, there are times when, when additional aid, uh, aid that, that's not necessarily need-based, um, is, is a, a good thing. If, if it's, if it's going to be the difference between keeping a child uh, enrolled at the school or having them move to another school, uh, it, it may be worth, worth doing. Uh, if it's a matter of uh, giving a little bit more so that you get you know, a coveted uh, artist or, or dancer or singer or musician or uh, hockey player, uh, it, it, may, it may well meet your enrollment goals. But, but the, the key here is that when you, when you do that kind of thing, you need to have a, a reason for it. There has to be, it has to match up with, with your overall enrollment goals. Um, and, and I think that that's, that is um, obviously going to change from school to school and maybe from grade to grade. Uh, within the school, uh, but but I think uh, a a best practice is is not necessarily to um, not necessarily not to do it, uh, but but definitely if you're going to be if you're going to be leveraging your your financial aid dollars uh, for for that kind of thing, um, you just have to to be sure that that it's aligned with where your, what your overall what your overall goals are. Yeah, there, there are lots of different reasons as to why schools might want to do that. I mean, part of it is budgeting, part of it is knowing where the money is coming from, part of it is uh, having some flexibility um, um, you know, so during actual operations to, to, to make changes to, to get the outcomes you want. But in a, in a financial aid or net, re net revenue management model, all that stuff can be built in. So you can have your merit awards versus your actual, you know, financial aid awards that are, are differentiated. Uh, and one reason you want to do that is you want to track sort of the, the non-financial aid component to any aid that's given so that over time you can assess whether or not that's actually being you know, handled successfully or efficiently as well. So the best practice is track it. Um, and if you're doing it, definitely know that you're doing it and not, and not make an arbitrary thing. Okay, uh, I have actually two things from Parnell Hagerman. Uh, one is an observation, so the rich are paying for the poor. And the question would be, uh, does the trend have to include parental input? Uh, I guess do they make a decision based on the extra award that is suggested. The, the parental input, whether or not they are, can you repeat that question? Um, I, I assume this means that, that, that the trend would have to include parental input, uh, i.e., we made our decision based on, you know, the extra financial aid that you offer to us. Um, I suppose so. I mean, I, I think that I think that it involves some kind of feedback mechanism. You know, that that if um, I think you want to, I think you want to know whether or not the the aid is sufficient or why they've declined it. Uh, if they're not, if they're not accepting it, you know, I think that's all very useful. It's not critical, but, but certainly useful. In terms of whether or not the rich are paying the poor, I mean, I, I think that's a really important question. Um, you know, our, our feeling is that, that this is not so much about um, creating this sort of discrepancy between the rich and the poor. It's really about identifying first what your, what your institutional goals are. I mean, it has to align with that. If, if, the, if your institution's goals is to have as a very diverse population. That is that really is the guiding, you know, the the, the guiding definition of the guiding principle behind your enrollment in the financial aid strategy. And, and it doesn't, you know, what we say is that uh, it's better to know what you're doing rather than do it arbitrarily. Because ultimately, the rich are paying for the poor. Currently, in those non-net revenue managed models, we're just doing it without knowing it. We don't know 
how much we're overpaying, or how much the rich are overpaying or underpaying, or how much the poor are not getting the benefit of you know the the financial aid um, um, capacity that the school has. Uh, so knowing is definitely better than not knowing. Um, in terms of the the merit award thing, I, I you know the 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 other point I was going to make about that is um, the reason you don't want to hide sort of ancillary awards or merit awards and all that is that you don't want to get in a position of not really understanding your discount rate because then you start to get in this cycle of um, you know being a little self you know you misunderstand sort of the, your, your pricing and your, and, your, and your value proposition in the market and that creates a, a pretty dangerous situation when you really want to, to, to be careful and you really want to sort of maximize you know, every dollar you're spending financially down the road. So the more you make transparent for yourself, the better. And that's true not just with that, but uh, with the kinds of students that you want to enroll and call it rich, call it poor, and we, we, we really think it's really about uh, crafting the the optimal balance um, that's aligned with the mission of the school, and moving from there, you know, to to sensible financial aid and net revenue management strategy. So net revenue management is um, ideology agnostic. It's really just about making sure that whatever ideology or whatever principles, whatever mission that you have, um, that you're doing it with some science. Okay. Um Scott Baytosh is asking, is net tuition management about willingness to pay rather than ability to pay? Current financial aid practice looks solely at ability to pay. Yes, I, I think I think that, that you do have to um, you do have to, to sort of broaden your definition for for uh, ability to, to include willingness um, because because there's if you base it entirely on ability to pay uh, based on what you see on the books, uh, you know, based on their reports, based on, on the calculations that come back, um, that, that's not necessarily the whole story in terms of, of, of their willingness. So, so oftentimes, you know, somebody will find a way, and this is what Ernest was talking about when he says, you know, if you're overpaying, um, oftentimes people will find a way to come up with, with the gap uh, to meet to meet the gap uh, themselves, whether it's borrowing or or whatever, and we don't have to get into all the different ways that can happen. Um, but but with a, this model, the 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 net revenue model, uh, typically it's it's really about figuring out uh, through statistics, figuring out what what different groups, what different types of students are willing to pay. Uh, that goes that goes heavily into where you set your tuition to begin with. Uh, but then it, it also determines how you set your aid. Uh, figure out who's who's willing to pay what, and and then your models can can inform uh, how far or what kinds of, of aid packages to offer to this group or that group. Um, and and then of course that also builds in, uh, you know, the willingness to pay in terms of recruiting somebody, uh, getting somebody to come. Yes, maybe they can pay more, but but they're not going to come to your school without the the added the added uh, Aid package, um, and again, if that doesn't align with your with your school's uh, goals, then then it, the model isn't you know the model as we just described it um, probably isn't as good a fit. Okay. Ernest, uh, do you have any other? Uh, yeah, no, I think that's I think that's spot on. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Dana Nelson Isaacs is asking, could you comment on managing net revenue over a longer time period? For example, a K to eight school, pre K to eight, K to twelve. Um, it seems like the implications are more complicated for those than they are for a four-year school. Hmm. I, I think they're compl more complicated um, in in some sense. Uh, you know, there's obviously a lot more data to worry about, and you have to figure out tuition increases along the way. And <clears throat> you may not have enough data to go back. You know. Eight, you know, four cohorts for eight years, and, and that makes the model a little squishy. Um, but uh, something's better than nothing, and I would say that it's probably over time more important for schools with, um, you know, the K-8s and K-12s with with sort of long lifespan uh, enrollments 
to, to think about this because you you really think about net revenue not across you know a single year you think about net revenue across a lifetime of the student and you're really developing a model um, to try to capture retention over over a long span and that's a really important thing because the cost of recruitment is very very high and if you can get the model right so that you know that somebody coming K8 here and they're willing to pay the price that you set and and if you can discount them to get them there to a point where they're maximizing you know their eight years of revenue that they're giving to you, right, you've got a huge win. You know, that's work that you don't have to do in year two or year three or year four. So, you know, I think in a nutshell, um, yes, it's a little bit more complicated, you know, and statistically, so the mechanics of it's a little bit more com complicated. Well, I guess more complicated for us, you know, but from your standpoint as a school, it's something that you, d you should care about. Okay, uh, Rick Fields and Jeff Oldham are asking very uh, similar questions um, that kind of dovetail all uh, into that previous question about the long-term impact of offering these kinds of discounts in the younger grades. Um, does that result in a parental expectation that, that such heavy financial aid will continue through all the subsequent grades? Um, no, not necessarily. Yeah, it's, it's a really wonderful question because if you look at the data, it's, you know, um, net tuition revenue is actually sort of, it's, it's been, been under a lot of pressure. And even though there's a lot of anecdotal talk about how tuition is rising year on year and is outpacing inflation, in truth, it's not really. Uh, and if you look at actual net revenue models, um, it seems to be tracking uh, pretty consistently um, uh, across. And if not, it's coming down a little bit in the last few years, mostly because of the economy. But specifically in terms of long-term, you know, uh, and Roman trends and whatnot. Um, uh, it, your models need to be sensitive, and they need to adjust uh, periodically. They, they, they don't. They, not, it's not a static thing. You know, what you do one year is not necessarily what you do the following year. Um, so, in terms of creating expectation for, for parents, um, you know, I, I, I don't. I, I think that if there's any expectation, is that. Um, Parents are going to find the right school that has the right fit for the kid, and the financial aid package uh, is going to reflect that. So, if they happen to to compare two schools and and the the, the package looks differently you know, from year to year or, or or even in the first year, it's probably telling them something. It's probably telling something about the fit of the school, the the, the what the school's willing to do from from you know as, as to to. To, to get to get them enrolled from a, a fit standpoint, how it, how that's aligned, how how their profiles align to the school's mission and so forth. So I, I don't see it so much as it's setting any long-term uh, expectations uh, in terms of what the school's willing to do for them, um, because again, I think you have control over that. Um, but I think I think in, in general, um, if it does create an expectation, that it probably creates one where people start to think that schools are going to be sensitive to finding the right kind of family for, for, for that school. And, and I think just to, to underline that a little bit, I think that really points out the importance of understanding your model and, and of having a model that, that does take your school into account. If you're talking about a, a K-12 school and you're talking about what it looks like for a, a younger uh, family coming in, um, and, and how does that project out over time? You really do need to have a model that, that takes that into account and that thinks about them uh, from, from the start all the way through, uh, and, and the model needs to build that in. Uh, and what happens when you go from a lower school to a middle school to an upper school where there, where there are going to be you know, quite, off, you know, quite often some sort of a tuition change, uh, and, and how is the family going to be able to, or how are you going to be able to, to work with the family on that, and, and what impact does that have on your on your financial aid budget? So, it's it's not a simple question to answer by by any stretch, uh, but this is this is why it's also so important to make sure that you're giving the right money to the right families, um, and so that you aren't overstretching uh, and and giving more at some point that you then have to take away, um, or that you're that you're not doing that extra little bit that would keep a family there rather than having them leave. Um, and again, ideally, that's not determined by gut, but it's determined by, by some, some longitudinal data that's going to give you a, a sense. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I think one of the problems today is that financial aid can be somewhat arbitrary. You know, a family gets one package this year, and next year is completely different. And maybe 
much higher or much lower, and, and it's not really clear why. You know, some of it's based on need, some of it's based on need plus, but you know, it's kind of it's 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 not always systematic, um, or at least less than systematic, as is how I would phrase it. You know, what I would say is that these numbers, once you have your models, they, they generally, you, you generally don't have a lot of room to make very, very big changes to, to swing things one way or the other. Um, um, because, you know, you, you, your brand is not entirely up to you and your price is not entirely up to you, so you are constrained by, by some bounds. But what, what you have is the ability to, to within the, the, the population that you currently have, the subpopulations that you currently have, is to maximize revenue along the way. So that for every dollar you're spending, you're spending more wisely is what's happening. Um, yeah, oh, I'll just stop there. Okay, uh, Laura Martin's asking if there is a discount rate you recommend aiming for, particularly for an under-enrolled school. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I'm the best one that's qualified to answer that question. I think that I think there's so much that goes into that. Um, you know, I think there's some recent data that's coming out around general discount rates, and, and I could be wrong about this, um, but I think a lot of independent schools are saying sort of the average is a lot. The means around 20, 20, 20 something percent. And again, I could be com completely wrong about that. My take is that whatever the number is, that's neither right or wrong. I mean, it's it's really, it's, it's really it's up to your board and it's up to it's up to you know the, the financial capacity of the school. Um, the, what I would say is that whatever discount rate you're at, uh, if if managed properly, you'll probably squeeze more money out of that, and that can then uh, become an engine for for improvements along the way. So you know, if you go back to the simple model that we looked at earlier, if you discount badly and, and you're making basically one million over um, over your, your 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 bottom line as opposed to two million, you know, there's 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 a spread of one million there that you can pour back into any number of things, into more merit, into more to more support for the students, into more um, endowment support, and so forth and so forth. Okay, um, Rick Fields is asking, have you had success in conducting price elasticity studies? Um, if yeah. so, can you describe or give an example of? Uh, I won't get very deep into that, but, but, but the econometrics around this includes price elasticity studies. Um, it, it has to be part of the package. Um, that sort of determines one way or the other how much you can move uh, different subpopulations or even the whole sticker price. So that, that the answer is, when, when you actually get down to the science of doing this, that, that's part of the whole that's part of the whole shebang, you know, which is which is why it's it's not something that you can say that's that's a fixed discount rate or is a fixed number that's that's good for a school. It really depends on the market, depends on how you're competing, uh, what you're competing against, depends on the prices others are set, depends on depends of depends on the, the demographics in your in your um, enrollment pool and so forth. Okay, the last question here uh, is from John Aim. He's asking if. Uh, you have a list of independent schools, not colleges, using this strategy, and are they successful with it? Um, the answer is not at level five or level six. Um, and some of, um, I should probably not mention it publicly, um, but um, yeah, I, I, think, I think some schools are definitely getting involved in net revenue management in a serious way. Um, but I would say on the whole, in terms of um, because we do, we, we, we work both in the college space as well as the independent school space. Uh, the, certain, the independent schools are certainly lagging behind by, by about four or five years. Um, so uh, we are, we're just now getting into, into you know, in, into this in a heavy way uh, with independent schools. Okay, great. Um, Ernest, if you wouldn't mind putting your contact screen up there once again. Uh, if anyone has any additional questions, please feel free to email either Ernest or Steve, uh, and they'll be more than happy to uh, answer your questions individually. Um, also, I want to make attendees aware that uh, SSATB will be putting out a State of the Independent School Admission Report. We did a survey last year, and it contains some very interesting information on financial aid, uh, and in addition to financial aid budget setting and the role of the admission office. 
Uh, I want to thank our audience for tuning in, and a special thank you to Ernest and Steve from the Proof Group for providing our attendees with such a helpful presentation. Uh, just a reminder, I will send all registrants a link to the online webinar page where you'll find a recording and a PDF of the presentation as soon as they're available. Thank you again, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.